thank you for watching this video. Uh, IP Adam Whitaker here. Uh, I had the chance to interview Fide Master John Curtis this morning, the magician. Uh, and it was for a documentary I'm making about the benefits of chess. But after I took out the parts that I needed for that documentary, there was still a lot left over, and that's what this will be. Uh, he had a lot of great stories, and I didn't want to just store them on my computer. So I hope you enjoy it. Thanks. Because we're at the advanced level, I think we need a grandmaster help to help us. So I'm going to bring in a chess grandmaster to help us right look at the board from the correct perspective and ask ask the grandmaster why rook to b1 was played. And I hope you're happy with that. Okay, grandmaster Teddy is here today. Surprise, surprise, grandmaster Teddy. I'm glad to have you here on the uh, YouTube stream. Well, I oh, I'll tell you what, I'm a Captain America fan. When I was younger, um, I used to go to school and uh, the Marvel comics had just started coming out into Australia and I used to wait for the Gordon and Gotch delivery truck to the local newsagent so I could get all the uh, Marvel comics there. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, I've got... Uh, I, had all the, I had all the originals and my... My mum, my mum made me throw them away. Oh, no, yeah. I could buy a couple of houses with them now. See if I can find my questions here. Ah, uh -huh. throw, throw me all the curly ones. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, just the first one was uh, just did you grow up playing chess or did you find it through school or anything like that? Uh, well, funny, funny you should say that. That was one of the questions that I noticed on um, on the message that you sent me, and um, and uh, I remembered that uh, I was just just um, going to school. I must have been about uh, fifteen years old or something like that, and uh, or fourteen. And there's a guy called Dennis Sivy, the S I V Y. I actually contacted him recently. He was on Facebook, and I thought, oh, I wonder if that's the, the Dennis Sivy, my school friend. Because he taught me how to play chess, and uh, yeah, so it was uh, uh, an enlightening thing. And once I, I touched the pieces and learned how to move, move them, I never stopped. <laughs> it just it was like a drug. It was like a drug. Yeah. What I found was it was ex it was I had a, a bad childhood. Uh, like my mother and father broke up and things like that. Or my mother had to leave my father, and. Um, and um, I, I found chess is uh, like, um, if I look back now, I can see um, that uh, chess was a, a fill-in. And uh, not only that, it was, um, it, it was a tool that was expanding my mind on how to think and deal with the world. Uh, you know, like, because it gave me extra tools to think laterally and to, you know, like expand my horizons and, and all those sort of things. And because I didn't have a father, I, I tended to drift towards um, more senior men in, in, in the social atmosphere, the social arena, to learn from them. And so it was only a natural progression with chess that uh, I wanted to learn from the old grandmasters. So I used to read all the old Russian magazines, and you know, like uh, from the old Russian championships. And at one stage, I even started to learn a little bit of Russian. I've forgotten it all now, but I, but I remember I was starting to learn phrases and things like that. It started to, you know, I was assimilating everything, you know. Well, that's interesting. Yeah, I'm making a, a documentary about Paul Morphy also, and uh, David Lawson wrote a book about Morphy, and they said he had – he learned French just so he could read some letters and that he was doing research. And so it's kind of the that's, same thing. That's what happened to me. I, I found, yeah, I, I found that uh, I, I, when I was a, I, I, my, oh, my, my friend, oh, 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 well, I'll, I'll tell you about my little, I learned from, from in school. Do you want me to take you through the progression of what happened? Sure. Yeah. Just quick, in a, quickly in a, in a, in a grip. Yeah. So, um, and I used to go up to Hyde Park. In Sydney, in central Sydney, there's two two main parks in the centre of the city, and um, and these have chess tables, and they built them for the old men after the Second World War. As a matter of fact, it was near the War Memorial, 
And um, that, a lot of men were homeless. They didn't have jobs in those days after the Second World War. And uh, they would um, uh, play chess on these chess tables. And, that, and that's where I, I, I found it. I found these old men playing chess on the chess tables and after that I was just hooked. And um, and uh, as a matter of fact, one day I was playing there as a young man. I was only about 16 at the time. And I can remember clearly there was a, a young American fella came along and uh, he uh, he wanted to play for a dollar a game. I only used to play for 20 cents a game. My friend Taffy said, oh, I think he's a good player. And I said, oh, all right, well, I'll give him a go. Later on, I found out his name was Walter Sean Brown. <laughs> and uh, and he, he later became a, a, one of the strongest grandmasters winning the US Open. He won the, uh, that year. I, I went up to old St. John's Church at King's Cross in Sydney and, uh, and uh, they were holding the Australian Chess Championship there. And uh, uh, Sean Brown uh, was there, right? And he won the Australian Chess Championship by a uh, by a mile. And that was the guy that wanted to play me for a dollar a game. And um, you know, I adopted some of the things that you know, like he basically taught me. I sucked the information in, you know, what the systems he was using um, to, to smash me up. And I was just absolutely stunned that somebody could beat me in you know, sort of under a minute, you know, like, uh, and um, and uh, and so comprehensively, right? But um, yeah, so that was my story about Walter Sean Brown. I've got many more stories about uh, about those times, but uh, that was one of them. I'm just going to I'll turn this off. Yeah, I forgot phone. about that. He he was in Australia, or he had family there, I think, also. He had some time yes. in Australia. Yeah. yeah, as a matter of fact, I told people about a story um, uh, with Sean Brown. It was uh, uh, during a tournament I was up there and uh, there was two women fighting. And um, I asked asked a friend of mine there, I can't remember which one it was. This is during the Australian Championship. It was at the back of the hall. There was two women fighting. And they were I found out they were fighting over Sean Brown. He was a bit of a ladies' man. He had arranged to beat. Two two women at the same time. He got his times mixed up or something, and um, and they were fighting. You, know, you got a real quiet. You know, you could cut the air with a knife at the Australian Chess Championships, right? Because it was the Masters, and um, and you got these two women having a cat fight at the at the top of the end of the hall. <laughs> the Sean Brown caused all that ruckus. <laughs> oh, dude. Yeah, but he was a really likable character. Uh, when I was younger, uh, let's see now, um, I started off, I, my first chess rating was 20 question mark. A lot of people say, <coughs> you had a rating of 20? Yes, I had a rating of 20 question mark. And, um, yeah, and as I said to you, the um, Australian Championship where um, uh, Grandmaster Walter Sean Brown played, Oh, we referred to earlier. That was in St John's Hall in King's Cross, and um, and uh, there was a, a, a chess club there just formed. And I went along to my first chess club, and that was the chess club. It was called St John's Chess Club, and the wizard Abraham Stern. He would go there, the state champion, the, the Polish guy I told you about. And oh, he, as a matter of fact, um, uh, the Australian champ. Champion that was defending his title against uh, Walter Sean Brown was Fred Flatter or Alfred Flatter, and Fred was is a lifelong long friend of mine. And Abraham's sister, he actually married Fred Flatter, right? Uh, Silla Stern, and uh, we lost her, but uh, she um, she's a really lovely woman. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I, there's two teachers, two or uh, a teacher that I can mention here um, uh, in the interview. And, and, and it was Narelle Kellner. She was um, our women's state champion in New South Wales, Australia, for many, many years. And uh, she was a teacher. She was a teacher. So used to, she used to teach the kids. She was a smart lady. She used to teach the kids. <coughs> I was very, very fond of her. Um, a lovely, lovely lady, and um, yeah. So, but, uh, so many good people. Lots and lots of good people. 
Uh, it's, it's not hard to find good people in chess circles, you know. Um, yeah. So uh, going back to me, uh, hey, hold on, my chess tournaments are. I, I, I play in um, – I, I, I used to always try to play in the strongest tournaments possible. My forte was lightning chess. I used to like to play speed chess when I was younger <coughs> and still do. Um, and uh, the um, I, I won the state championship, the state lightning championship, this championship 10 times. But uh, before that, before I started getting all the wins, I used to rock up and play in these opens and open blitz tournaments and um, – I used to always love to battle the the, the so-called local champions and stuff, and uh, I, I kept working away, chipping away at them, and eventually uh, I started beating them all. And then, oh, and then I ran into the Russians. They, they ran into the Russians. Um, There's a, a few expatriate Russians. There was a, um, a guy called uh, Dmitry Jedivanishvili. <coughs> And uh, they were they were coming over from Russia and settling in Australia. The immigration program. There's another one called Alex Kanakevich, and another Russian. And um, whether it be Russia or one of the Soviet, um, then it was the United Soviet Socialist Republic or the USSR. But they might have come from a different. They might have come from a different place rather than Russia itself. I'm not sure. But um, but they're basically we, we used. To just gone Russians, right, in Australia. And, um, yeah, so it was Alex Kanakevich and Dmitry Genevanishvili, and there's a few others as well. And they, they they came over and they used to give me a jolly hard time because they were trained in the Soviet school of chess. And uh, under that uh, communist or so, so, uh, socialist system over there, if you wanted a job, you, they said, oh, what kind of job would you like uh, I'd like to be a chess teacher. I'd like to play a chess. We'll make you a chess teacher, right? You know, that's what you did. You just chose whatever you wanted to do in life as a as a career. And they might have they, they might they might have, might have said, that, "Oh, you're not a very good school teacher, so we'll make you a toilet cleaner." <laughs> I don't know, but uh, but um, but. Uh, my Russian accent's fake. <laughs> but uh, no, no, but it's just that, uh, yeah, the, the big influence on Australia too at the top level. And um, that's, and that was a good thing too because uh, we all grew. We all grew. We all, as a nation, we, we all grew uh, with all that. Uh, uh, oh, in Vietnam, Vietnam, Vietnam days, the old war days, the Vietnam War, um, we, um, Freddie Flatter, the Australian champion, he used to have a, a team called the uh, the Peaceful Pawns, the Peaceful Pawns, because he was all the chess players were anti-war. We, we'd battle on the chessboard, but we were all anti-war. So we formed the chess club, the Peaceful Pawns, and we'd protest against the Vietnam War. <laughs> and, um, yeah, so, um, yeah, we're, we're, we're uh, pacifists at heart, most chess players, so. Well, we see enough violence on the chessboard. We don't need any more violence in our lives. And uh, but uh, yeah, so it was going back then. And I I uh, I, uh, I used to oh I broke a world record once. So as I was going along developing my chess, I used to give demonstrations in chess school. Uh, in um, I gave yeah I gave a few demonstrations in schools chess and. Um, I, uh, I I do do um, simultaneous exhibitions in shopping centres. I used to do the old in Sydney, uh, Sydney's main heart of Sydney Hyde Park in Sydney in the Central Business District. They used to have a, the, the uh, what was called the Waratah Festival, and I played fifty players at once or something, and I won every game. And uh, yeah, and I used to like giving simultaneous exhibitions and and. Um, I probably had a title at that stage or something, and uh, and and it was it was just fun as far as the development side of things were concerned. And then I would battle. I'd like I'd like to go and battle in the Doble Cup. It used to be held by a millionaire um, down in um, Canberra, 
the, the, uh, the basically the uh, center of our uh, political um, your Washington or whatever, right? Our Canberra, Australia. <coughs> Excuse the cough. So much streaming and talking. <laughs> and um, I, I, I was playing the Doble Cup, run by a guy called Eric Doble. He was a, a builder. And um, as a matter of fact, I've got a book here that was uh, written by, uh, I'll show you. There was a book here written by. Uh, um, 50 years of chess history, you'll see um, there's Grandmaster Ian Rogers there, Australia's greatest player, and a few other uh, well-known people. That was probably Eric Doble, I'm not sure. Tony Wiedenhofer, Canberra celebrity, and don't know that one. <coughs> but that's a great book I found out. Ian, Ian Rogers told me about it, or someone told me about it, and... Uh, and uh, it's just, just such a, a great piece of work, 50 years uh, of Australian chess history in one book. And a lot of grandmasters, such as um, uh, American grandmasters, I think it was, uh, I can't remember which one it was, but there was a number of American grandmasters and Yugoslav masters, a Hungarian uh, international master, and they all come along to our Doble Cup because the millionaire will always put a few dollars in and pay for their airfares to have a few celebrities there. And uh, we had our own international masters playing in it. It was a big Australian week. And uh, there's plenty of prize money on offer. But my best result was I came second once and tied with Grandmaster Rogers. So I was uh, really pleased with that result. Now, that's across the board, you know. Um, uh, I've come second twice. I've been the bridesmaid second twice in the Australian Lightning Chess Champion or the Australian Blitz. Um, I tied with International Master Solomon. Um, uh, 13 gruelling rounds, I think it was, or 11 or 13 gruelling rounds. And we, I beat him in the tournament. And then... Um, and then, because at the time he was our, our best Australian Lightning chess player or Blitz chess player, and it was five minutes each on the clock, right? And um, as it was, then they said, oh, you've got to have a playoff. So uh, I, I, I played him two games and I beat him. <coughs> so at this stage, I put him in the tournament, right, in the actual tournament itself, where we tied equal first. You now we played two games and I beat him there twice. So at that stage, I've beaten him three times, right? They said, oh, no, it's the best of three. And you wouldn't believe it. I went and lost the next three. So so score with him was three all, and he got the Australian title. So I was a bit unlucky there. So I got the brides, mate. I came second um, at Hakoa Club, Bondi Beach, Australia's famous Bondi Beach. The Jewish Akoa Club there, they, they they had the tournament there. And um, I had Ian Rogers, Grandmaster Ian Rogers on the ropes in the Rook and Porn ending. And uh, I uh, I lost on time, I think, in a one position, something like that. It's not often I got him on the ropes. Oh, and I beat him when he first played in his first Australian Masters Championship. Uh, he was a young prodigy, prodigy. prodigy. And uh, like Paul Morphy, and uh, they said, oh, this guy's going to be good. He's going to win the Australian Championship. He's only a kid, but he's going to win the Australian Championship. Well, I had him beaten in 18 moves. <laughs> I crushed him. But he never, ever let me beat him again for the rest of his life. So um, I, I even laugh with him now. You know, like we're good friends. And I say, yeah, and I said, um, uh, you're never going to let me win another game for the rest of my life because you, you, he still remembers that game. And so he turns on full grandmaster force whenever he plays me. And it doesn't matter what I do, I know there's no way in the world because I haven't got anywhere near his abilities. So. <coughs> Nowadays, he's a, um, a journalist, a, a chess journalist. Um, uh, Ian? And um, he writes some wonderful books. And uh, he wrote a book recently called uh, Oops, I Resigned Again, right? 
It's one of the grandmaster books he just wrote. And uh, it's available on um, in the book depository and Amazon and stuff. And uh, I, uh, it's about uh, all the grandmasters that resigned in one positions, right? <laughs> they actually had a one, oh, sorry, uh, yeah, they had one positions and they, they actually resigned because they thought they were lost. They, they, they oh. stuffed it all up. Oh. Yeah, I think it happened to me once in the game against uh, uh, an Australian champion called Trevor Hay. I, I, I still vaguely recall he resigned in a tournament game against me. And uh, his position was winning position. And I knew it was a winning position, but he couldn't work it out because it was complicated, right? And he resigned. He just got fed up with it. And he, he said, oh, I give up. He walked off. And I thought, oh, all right, then I just won a game in a lost position. I was happy. But I, I just complicated it. That's one of the things I used to do. I used to love um, to play in the style of Mikhail Tal, who said famously, I like to take my opponents into a deep, dark forest. He said, where, where, where um, there's only one way out of this terrible, dark forest. He said, there's only a, a very narrow little alleyway. He said, but there's only room enough for one person to get through. In other words, he's talking about the complications of chess. And he, he gets through and he leaves the other person trapped in the deep, dark forest. Yes, well, as a matter of fact, um, not many people know this story, but um, I'll tell you because it's part of who I am and a bit of part of uh, chess folklore, I suppose. Uh, as a matter of fact, one of the players I learned from was a guy called Peter Parr. Uh, he, he, he would come to the um, – oh, he, he came in 1968. I was born in 52, so I was still about 16. That was right, 50, 16, yeah. And uh, he, he won the state championship in 1968. And he was he uh, actually uh, was the captain of Australia's Olympiad team many years later. And he ran a chess shop called Chess Discount Sales in Sydney. And basically, uh, he was an in, international chess arbiter as well. And so Peter became a lifelong friend. And I sort of learned a lot of chess from him. Um, yeah, so... Uh, Oh, I've got so much memory coming back there. So that was Peter. Uh, he was a bit of a character, but I got in, I did get introduced to quite a few people. A few, uh, I was about 19. I was going to play in my Australia, in the, my first Australian championship um, at Katoomba, right? And uh, I'll, I'll tell you this story uh, because it, it harkens on just how um, meeting different people uh, through chess I met, met wonderful people, all sorts of characters. I, I love I love the zany characters, you know, the 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 so-called oddballs, and um, uh, you know, they call some people nerds and this and that and everything else. But I I just love the uh, the full inclusion of society, from lawyers and doctors to uh, total eccentrics and people that eat the food out of bins and would go go to the chess chess centers and then the, you know like you get the uh, uh, the the uh, people that are um, uh, very outward in their um, expressions and uh, you get the uh, the people that were very withdrawn and so it, 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 I found that it just attracted people from all walks of life and all nationalities in Australia being a very um, I would say we um, uh, very uh, mixed society. Uh, uh, we had all sorts. We had uh, Latvians and we had the, the Hungarians and um, uh, you know and, and all the Europeans. Probably a lot of them settled after the Second World War. And obviously, in the fifties and sixties, um, they were all the middle-aged men in Australia. And um, and a lot of them played chess, the Europeans. And so uh, I, I made many, many friends uh, playing chess. As a matter of fact, I'll, I'll tell you this story. It's, it's a, a quite a unique story. And it tells you a little bit about how chess people can come together. I was playing at the table, so I was only a young man, and uh, I was about to go off to the Australian Championship, and a fellow came over, and I still to this day don't know his name, but he um, he uh, was kept 
going grabbing at my radio, and I thought he was going to steal my radio. And, and he, um, uh, you know, I had a radio just playing as I was playing chess in the park on the tables. And that you see that with the Botez girls doing the um, doing the videos and stuff. But this guy was a full on alcoholic, and um, and he had um, uh, methylated spirits. He was drinking methylated spirits. And I just went like this. I went, oh, he came right at me and he, he's going to grab the radio to try to pinch it or something, or maybe he's just going to look at it. But I thought he was just going to steal it or something, but he couldn't run anywhere. I, I actually just pushed him like that and he fell over and he landed on the back of his skull right on the edge. The rest of his body all landed on the grass, but his skull landed on the uh, concrete just as a paddy wagon was, the police paddy wagon was going by, and um, I, uh, I I was in shock. And they said, a, a police officer came over and he said, you know you killed him? I said, no. I said, I haven't killed him. I, I don't. He said, yeah, he's dead. He was lying to me. The police officer was lying to me. And um, now I started crying. You know, like I was only a young kid, you know, and I, I was raised as a sort of a Christian uh, person, uh, uh, total anti-violence, right? And um, if I was going to kill anybody, I'll kill them on the chessboard, right? <laughs> anyway, um, yeah. So um, I, I had I, it was later found out I, I was winning the Australian Championship. I, I won all my games, and then then I got a phone call up at, at the Australian Championship saying that I've got to go to court. And I've been charged with murder, and I thought murder. I thought who, who have I murdered, right? And I found out that uh, later that he actually came out of hospital. He was fine. He was released from hospital. But I didn't know that, right? He, the fellow that fell over, he was actually released from hospital. But he, he died about nine months later. But if you if if uh, something that you do under, under uh, British law uh, or Australian law, it's the same legal system, um, if something you do that might affect someone's health or, or eventually their death, even nine months later that might have contributed to it, well, then you can still be charged for that act, right? Anyway, they, they downloaded it to um, manslaughter. <laughs> then they down, downloaded the charges to uh, uh, assault, occasionally grievous bodily harm, right, which is only 10 years. That was nice of them. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, but here comes the bit about the social links in chess. Uh, I was down in the in the in the uh, in the uh, when I when I was arrested and I was down in the police station. One of the players that was at, at chess tables, he's, he he saw what had happened. He knew I didn't hit the fellow or anything like that. And uh, it's just a, a miracle. He was just that stupefied with all this methylated spirits that you'd only have to push him with your pinky. And he would have fallen over and the same thing would have happened, right? And I just went like that with an open hand. And uh, anyway, so uh, a couple of people from the tables, uh, some people I didn't even know, some of the chess players, they went down to the police station and they did statements and everything to say what really happened and that I was innocent of any uh, wrongdoing and stuff. And, uh, and then... Um, the uh, Max Fuller came down. He was the Australian Open Australian champion at the time, and he vouched for me. And Peter Parr was the, he was the state champion. So I got all these chess players going down there. You have never seen so many chess players in a in a, um, in a, a police station. And uh, and then uh, there was a guy called Frank Lowe, and he's still with us today. Frank Lowe from Frank Lowe Jung and Co. Solicitors, and and Frank used to play with me, play chess with me at St George's Leagues Club. They used to call it the Taj Mahal in uh, because it was like a big giant white building, you know, like sort of uh, like the Taj Mahal. And that was in uh, Cogra in Sydney. And um, anyway, so Frank was the solicitor and he, he said, I'll represent you. And I thought, oh, oh isn't that, wasn't that kind? He said, oh, no, you don't have to pay, pay me anything. He said, oh, I'll represent you because I know you wouldn't do a thing like that. And um, and then then I, I needed the barrister, and the barrister, the guy put up his hand. He'd only just become a, a barrister and been uh, admitted to the bar. And who was that? It was John Purdy. Now you might not have heard of John Purdy, but J. S. Purdy. He was the Australian champion. He was the youngest Australian chess champion um, uh, when he was uh, nineteen or something. 
And uh, his father was C.J.S. Purdy, Cecil Purdy, uh, who was um, three times world correspondence chess champion. And, um, yeah, C.J.S. Purdy. And so he was my barrister. And then apparently when, when the, court, well, the first judge that came in to hear the case, he said, I can't hear the case. He said, because I'm a chess player. He says, I know John personally, so I can't hear the case. So I have to absolve myself from it. And uh, the next next judge that came, he said, oh, he says, I happen to know him too. He said, so I can't hear the case. The third judge said, well, um, I've heard of him. I'll hear the case anyway. And uh, and they got, anyway, the cert, as it was, it, it put things in a nutshell, the um, specialist from the, uh, um, you know, for, uh, uh, from the morgue or whatever, the mortician or whatever, he came in, he gave evidence that the guy had had a previous fracture in the same spot. So all he did was he reopened the previous fracture that he already had there. So it's not like I could, you know, I did anything to contribute to his bad health. Um, he fell over and he just opened up an, a fracture that was already there. So that's that's what actually took place. And, uh, and then so that I had no criminal record or anything like that. And um, and later on, I went on to become a, um, a fraud investigation manager for one of the major banks. And uh, I, I used to work in the uh, undercover and stuff like that. And I had a role of like detective status. And I, because I loved analytics, you know, like some chess was analytical. And so it was only a natural progression. I think they must have noticed that in the uh, in the uh, in the bank at the time that. Uh, I had a um, an aptitude for um, analysing things, so they decided, hey, he'd make a good investigator. So I became a fraud investigator. So that that's uh, that that's just just shows you a little bit of the social backgrounds um, that that uh, you know, sort of, you know, the people you meet and uh, and how that all came together for one one event. You know, so when I look back with uh, fondness of all those people. That, uh, that contributed to um, my having a normal life uh, um, uh, because if I was a young person uh, or, or a middle-aged person from, say, the war, I didn't speak very good English, I wa wasn't connected socially in any way, um, things may have turned very ugly and uh, maybe there might have been some injustice. I might have done prison time or something uh, 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 although I was an innocent person. Um, so, um, yeah, so uh, 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 the chess community is just such a wonderful, vibrant community and, um, and people pull together and they, they help each other and I always try to uh, make myself available to help others, right, you know. And uh, I hope that answers your question in a, in a sort of a brief sort of way. And uh, it was not only I, there was a, a friend of mine called Abraham Stern. He's a Polish uh, Jewish guy. And I um, and, uh, loved Abraham. But we used to call him the wizard, funnily enough. And uh, I'm called the magician on chess.com. And I named, I named myself after yeah, the magician, uh, Mikhail Tal, who was the, one of the youngest world chess champions from Russia. And um, actually, Riga is the wizard of is known as the wizard of Riga, and in, in those early days, um, uh, Abraham Stern uh, he um, he uh, uh, he sort of inspired me, right? You know, uh, but he'd always be so brilliant that he'd try to get more brilliance out of things than than uh, what was. And uh, I, I used to start beating him because I. I worked out that he was pushing the, the limits too far. He just used to love chess as an art more more than a um, a bit of everything. Chess is everything, you know. And um, yeah, so um, I'm absolutely amazed, and so proud of the guys that developed Chess.com. And I'm not saying it just because I'm a Chess.com streamer. I love my Chess.com. I really do. I would stream for nothing. Don't tell them. Shh. I would stream for nothing if um, uh, and, and try to teach people chess for nothing uh, because I want to give back to others. I, I love giving back. 
there's no point in learning something, just keeping it all to yourself, you know, secret knowledge business and all the rest of it. Um, now, I, I love to, to, to give back, and I get children on my channel. Uh, they come in occasionally, right? And I don't encourage children to come in into my channel. They just do because I, I've got a very wholesome channel. Um, and uh, FM John Curtis Chess, we've got Grandmaster Teddy. Now, I, you've probably heard of him. He's an international celebrity and maybe one or two kids like Grandmaster Teddy, but he's a Christmas bear and uh, he was born in 2005. There he is. <coughs> and uh, twin Teddy. We've also got a little friend of his. He's well known around the world, and particularly in America. And Paris. My son went to Paris. As a matter of fact, it's his goofy. And when you play chess, you should not make goofy moves, right? So maybe a few of the children out there are, are learning a few things about chess and having a little bit of fun at the same time, and that's all very harmless, isn't it? But it's that, but. Uh, but the most important thing is we're trying to give them a bit of an education and, um, and, and, and some of the kids are brilliant nowadays. You know, I, can't, I don't cease to be astounded by Pragnanda Har and Gukesh and all these wonderful Indian young men that came along under basically a school system, <coughs> excuse me, a school system um, where they've all followed... Um, um, Vishwanathan Anand, Vishy Anand, the world chess champion, the great world chess champion, Vishy Anand. And um, he's, he's created, you know, it's just expanded, the whole world of chess has just expanded so much. So, um, uh, yeah, so uh, chess in schools is big in Sydney, Australia. Um, there's a, a chess centre down in Burwood in Sydney. And uh, I, I think one guy there's got hundreds of schools. I know there's a, uh, I think it's Chandler Chess or something like that. Oh, no, great Gardner Chess. So if you want to look it up, Gardner, G-A-R-D-I-N-E-R -E Chess in Queensland. And they've got Chess in Schools program too. And I, I believe they've got several hundred schools uh, where, where the kids learn to play chess. So, um, yeah, and I'm all for it because I, I just think it's just such a, a, uh, a a wonderful thing, you know, um, and and also the girls like to play too, right? So um, <coughs> I went up to Wyong recently, which is just a I'm in the I'm a one hour north of Sydney here, um, Grandmaster Teddy and I, and um, we um, we uh, went up to Wyong, which is just the next couple of suburbs up the up north. And, uh, and there was a school there. I was so surprised. There's something like 300 children in the school hall. <coughs> and um, they had a big giant chess congregation there in the school hall. And uh, I, I just, and they came from all different schools. They could hardly even fit them into this massive um, hall. And, uh, and when the, the, the chief teachers would say, right, Go to your boards or whatever it was. They're just all so silent, well behaved, and that was because they were doing what they actually loved to do. They love playing chess. The kids love playing chess, and um, yeah. And I saw a similar thing at um, Central Coast Leagues Club, which is uh, one of our. We have leagues clubs, which are like football clubs, and um, you know they serve alcohol. And they're basically mini casinos, but. <clears throat> but we had the auditorium there and, and we had, uh, oh, maybe just, again, 250-odd uh, children there for a massive tournament. And I said, oh, where's the publicity? And uh, anyway, they said, um, I said, oh, we haven't got any media here. And I said, oh, I know what we'll do. So um, there was a billionaire. He used to run um, called uh, 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 Frank Packer. And I think it was yeah, Frank Packer. Yeah. Anyway, I uh, my uh, one of the chess players in Sydney. He taught Frank Packer how to play chess, the billionaire. And so it's good for him and his business mind. It should be good for everybody. And uh, anyway, uh, uh, Terry Shaw. He was an Olympian. 
Uh, Terry's left us now. He's upstairs somewhere. And uh, yeah, Terry Shaw, he um, he taught, I, I believe he taught uh, Kerry Packer how to play. So I just said, oh, I rang up Channel 9 and I said, oh, Mr. Packer would be very upset if uh, this tournament wasn't uh, being covered. You know he plays chess, don't you? And they had, within an hour, they had a team of uh, cameras down there from the Channel 9 News and uh, to cover all the kids. So they were all little stars for the day. And, uh, yeah, so that's just a little bit about chess and schools in Australia. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, here in uh, Missouri, it's a few hours away from me, a few hours drive, but there's uh, Rex Sinkfield, who's a billionaire who uh, supports chess and has a chess I've heard of Sinkfield. Yeah. S-I-N-Q-U-E. Yeah. I've heard of the Sinkfield Cup. Yeah, he... Uh, he started the yeah. St. Louis Chess Club, and then he paid for the Hall of Fame. And I think the United States Chess Federation is moving to St. Louis too. Uh, but yeah, he he finances that tournament for the the Grandmasters, the Sinkfield Cup. Well, well, uh, in in chess, I'll tell you another story about uh, chess. Going back to that other question we had earlier about the so who do you meet socially in chess, and um, I. Um, uh, I had a friend. He's left us too now. He's gone upstairs as well. But um, he uh, he he wanted to uh, organise a chess tournament. I said, oh, okay. He said, we should go to um, one of Australia's richest men. I said, oh, well, um, I said, Dato Tanchin Nam, that's his name was Dato Tanchin Nam. He was a billionaire. And he used to uh, run all the uh, international Lightning congresses all over, all over the world and, and donate money for those, you know, for the grandmasters, right? And I'm going to get to this in a second. But um, Dato used to also be involved in horse racing, right? So uh, Dato attention now. And he, he was mainly a breeder. He wasn't a gambler or anything. But he was, uh, um, he was mainly into property, like Westfield shopping centres all over the world, right? And they had quite a few shopping centres in um, America. And uh, he, uh, we, we got to talking and he said uh, how he uh, used to name all his horses after chess pieces, right, and, and after chess. And one of the, the chess, one of the horses, right, that um, you'd be happy to know this one, one of the horses that he, um, he named was Paul Morphy. That's right. In Australia, we had a horse running called, actually, it wasn't called Paul Morphy, it was called Morphy, M O R P H Y. But he was, the horse was named after Morphy, right? We, and uh, so I thought you'd like that one. See, so you're going to do something on Morphy. And um, he had another horse called White Queen. And he had another one called Perpetual Check that ran in our famous Melbourne Cup. It's an international horse race. And he actually won the, the Melbourne Cup, but it wasn't a chess named horse. It was called Saintly, Saintly, and that was that was his horse that won the Melbourne Cup. As this was at the time, it was Australia's richest horse race. And anyway, he used to have a friend called Grandmaster Goufeld, Edward Goufeld, right? And um, Edward Goufeld uh, um, uh, said to him, he said, "Oh, why do you name that horse after me? He called the horse Goufeld." Right, <laughs> like he called the other one Morphy. He said, oh, "He said I called the horse Goofel because it's fat, just like you." <laughs> <coughs> and uh, but this horse might have been fat, but it was pretty good up to about sixteen hundred meters and ran like the wind and won quite a few races. Yeah, so um, yeah, that, that's just a, a few stories about. Uh, um, but uh, oh, he, and he put a he put a check of twenty. He wrote a check out for me for twenty thousand dollars. He says, "Oh, he said I I trust you." He said, uh, uh, "I'd like you to run the tournament as long only as long as you're in complete control of the tournament." I said, "Oh, I said, oh, thank you very much, but I don't run tournaments." And I gave me twenty thousand back. <laughs> and my friend, my friend who was with me, he said, uh, "He said you're crazy, you're crazy." I said, no, 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 no. I said, no. I said, no, it's a matter of principle. I, I just don't run tournaments. I said, but I invite anybody else that wants to go and see him and if he wants to sponsor the tournament, they can. That, he might give them $20,000. <laughs> 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 
Uh, I was talking about, about Grandmaster Ian Rogers. Right. You know, I'll just be quick with that. Uh, basically, uh, Dato Tenshin Nam, the billionaire chess player, he said uh, to Grandmaster Rogers, he said, to, ah, he says, Ian, he said, I'd like to name a horse after you too. He said, we'll call it Rogers. And Ian said, you're not naming a horse after me. <laughs> there you go. So, and and uh, it was only like recently, I don't want to say recently in terms of my life, that uh, Ian told me a secret. He said, uh, I was the reason that he started playing chess. He was reading an article about me in a magazine once, and, uh, and Ian Rogers is probably Australia's greatest chess player, right, as far as, yeah. Um, and uh, and uh, he said, oh, and I was reading an article in the magazine. I thought I said to myself, gee, that John Curtis can play chess. Well, I can too. And he became Australia's greatest grandmaster. Yeah. Oh, I, I just found that I had an analytical mind and, uh, and uh, oh, they just uh, put me in charge of the legal the bullies to run the the uh, we got four major banks in Australia. We did have four majors. We used to call them the big four, and I was uh, working in one of the big four banks. I used to run the legal department there, and, um, and they said, "Oh, we'll make him an investigator." I think we, he's pretty good with the legal side of it. We'll get him into the criminal law, and uh, and I thrived there. I actually really thrived in the. Uh, Investigation area. Uh, I even solved the murder once um, uh, just by reading the local Sunday paper. Uh, and uh, I saw the, the dead, dead lady's name reminded me it was the same name as the girl I'd gone to school with. I thought, I hope it's not her, but she was too young to be the same person. But that's what attracted me to it. And because I was in charge of all the automatic telemachine cameras, um, I um, I just thought, oh, she might have been walking past down the street past one of my cameras before she was murdered. You never know, there might be something there. And the police had never even asked me for it. I, I just uh, thought, well, their theory that, you know, this guy had done this murder, and I thought, no, that's not right. It doesn't make sense to me. And uh, my analytical thinking, I thought differently from them. And uh, sure enough, I, I rang them up and I chased them down and I got the time of death and I searched through all the uh, the video and I, I found it was one of my favourite cases because I, uh, I, I, I found the, the woman uh, walking down the street, right? Oh, not walking, yeah, walking down the street. <coughs> and as it was, we found out later, the killer was actually in the ATM vestibule, believe it or not. And um, and it was an unsolved case for many years. It was 14 years later after I left the bank, I got a phone call saying the unsolved homicide squad uh, wanted to let you know that uh, uh, the guy was in jail for another matter and he was bragging about the murder and how he got away with it. And uh, uh, our officer was in the room with him, uh, wired to be a cellmate, yeah. Yeah, but, but that just goes to show you. And I used to get real a real good feeling about trying about my job, helping people too. Yeah, victims of crime. I used to love um, helping people that were victims of crime uh, because I, I, I felt you know I was doing something worthwhile in the community. Yeah, and uh, little did they know that I was using my chess skills, my analytical skills. <laughs> And I'm, I'm just sort of uh, in a good good place. I'm retired now and I just sort of, uh, I'm, I, chess is giving me uh, a new life, right? Again, it's renewed my life again after leaving the workplace. And um, and now I'm a chess.com streamer for chess.com and I love it. I love it. And uh, I, I, I try to, to give back again. I, I try to stream and make sure that... Uh, uh, I look after as many people as I can that support my channel and, um, and and just enjoy having fun because my channel is all about having fun and at the same time learning experience. So I try to uh, be a good teacher, um, put my sensei hat on and, and I call them my grasshoppers. There used to be a show on TV called uh, Chai Quang Chain. 
Kane, Chai Queen, Chain, uh, uh, Kane, and uh, he was, was about to say, there was a Western with this uh, fellow that came from China, he worked his place through. But, but uh, when they, they used to always go back to the Buddhist monk, um, uh, the Buddhist uh, temple where he came from and everything, his master would always say, oh, grasshopper, you must do this. And so I called them my grasshoppers, right, you know, in the, in the channel. And I just sort of, uh, oh, I did that for a while. I don't put that on him. Well, you know what it is? It's a Dimplex window fan cover. I found it in the garage and I thought, I know where I'll be able to use that silly thing. And I found Teddy there. It's my, my Christmas Teddy. I bought him back in 2007. He was second hand. And uh, well, Goofy belonged to my deceased son, right? So um, uh, if I can give uh, uh, children um, or, or young people just a, a bit of a laugh, I try to be a bit comedic in my some of my videos, right? I carry on a little bit and uh, act a bit eccentric. <laughs> but um, uh, they call me grandpa too. They call me grandpa. But uh, I'm just really in, in, in a good space at the moment. I meet, I'm still meeting um, so many wonderful people. And um, uh, the internet and, um, and chess streaming has uh, opened my world uh, that much more. Um, I, I can... Um, Talk to, uh, occasionally get the chance to talk to grandmasters that I would never see, you know, sort of on the other side of the planet, um, be, having been born in the 1950s. Um, you know, we didn't have that sort of technology then. And, and Australia being a remote place, if you, if you haven't got a lot of money to, to travel, right, um, and you have to work and support a family, and so you don't get to meet all those people. And I was a family man, so I didn't, I wasn't, didn't have that opportunity to uh, um, uh, to really push the limits of my abilities as far as chess was concerned, right? Uh, because I, I preferred to raise a family, right? And that was the option that I took, you know. I did, did test the waters a little bit. I represented Australia in the Asian Teams Championships in Hong Kong. And I went over there and I played... Uh, Oh, there was India and Malaysia and a whole lot of other countries there. And uh, I got more than 50%, but I, I, I soon decided, hey, Johnny, uh, you haven't got the aptitude to be a world champion or to be a super grandmaster. And, and I knew that that wasn't the case. So I decided, oh, I, know, I, I know what I'll do. I'll just sort of uh, plod along, just be happy with my strength where I'm at, be in a good space, a good head space. And that's where I try to encourage young kids that might come on to the channel or young people or, 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 or uh, I get grown-ups that uh, are sometimes children. <coughs> and, um, and they have things like fear of losing, for instance. I had one fellow, he, he had a fear of losing and so I, I, I consoled him and I, I told him uh, you know, about how the most important thing is to um, enjoy what you're doing at the level that you're best capable of. It doesn't mean that you limit yourself, but it means that uh, instead of having a fear of doing something, no, just push push the limits as far as you can. And um, if you're feeling too uncomfortable, then just pull back a little bit always be happy with the results that you achieve because you're doing the best that you can. So it's just the same as a person that's a lawyer and he's very intelligent, he's a good lawyer. Well, if you're a cleaner and, and you're a good little cleaner and um, and that's the best that you can do, you know, with your, your capabilities, but uh, just be happy with what you're doing and uh, you're still doing a really valuable function in society and contributing to society. And it's, it's the same with chess. Most important thing is to be a competitor, to be in the game of life and um, and to enjoy yourself, right, to the best of your ability. Everyone has a different ability. We're all different, you know, and difference, the, the difference is good. And I always tell people, I say, well, if I play a grandmaster, I play in Title Tuesday, I always like to challenge myself. 
And I tell people, no, 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 um, always play the best possible players that you can play. Always uh, don't be um, happy smashing up patsers or beginners or rabbits or whatever you want to call them. Um, but uh, always um, uh, push the boundaries. And it doesn't matter if you lose because what have you got to lose? You're learning and you've got that valuable experience and the fun that you um, that you played such a, a great player. And uh, I've been rewarded. I actually beat Grandmaster Hans Neiman, 2,943 rated, you know, number 40, 53 in the world or 43 in the world. And, um, and and that's right beyond my capabilities, right? But I get that option. I get that opportunity through chess.com and uh, the Title Players uh, Tournament to be able to uh, play those players that I would never, ever see or dream of playing in my lifetime, you know. And chess.com has given that, all that to me and it's given it to every child that wants to learn to play chess <coughs> or any adult. And I tell people, some people will come to me and they'll say, oh, but I learned too late. You know, all the good players are young. And I say, no, 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 no. Some players have actually become grandmasters, a few of them, that started chess very late. But they just decided to work hard. They decided that's going to be my dream. And they went along and they did it, right? And uh, so age is not a precursor to being a great chess player. It should not hold you back, right? Obviously, there are more important things in life, such as uh, looking after your family and um, paying the bills and things like that. You know, that everyone has to settle down to the real factual things in life. But um, but but still, if you uh, if you can make that that break and you you decide that oh, no, I'm just going to go for it, well, there's nothing stopping you, right? Friday Master Johnny Curtis here, and you heard it right, 98.7% accuracy in a one-minute game, and the game only lasts 11 moves. Check rate in 11 moves, 98.7% accuracy in a one-minute game. Let's get into it. Okay, here we go. Right, we're playing 64321. That's his name. He's rated 1591 and he's from the United States. Now, mind you, this is a one minute game. You can see the clocks there. E6. And we only have, it's only going to last nine moves. I've played two moves. It doesn't look like checkmate, does it? Okay, so he should play D5. He played Bishop E7, but that's okay. I played E5. He played d5, so he's doing all the right things. It's an excellent move according to his chess engine. Now, this isn't a one-minute game. He's doing all this in a second. So he's a, not a bad player. I played knight to f3, star move, right? He played f6, right? Okay, here I played the second best move. I played bishop d3 because we're playing one-minute chess, and my idea is to get an attack at any cost quickly. Why? Because I'm slow at one minute chess. So I really got to go for a checkmate. He took the pawn off. Now recaptured with the knight. Star move. This is why I'm getting 98.7% accuracy. Can you? He played knight there. Can you see the correct move in this position? Yes, queen check. That's correct. Okay. So you give him a big check. Now, he can't play king here, right? This is, mind you, it's all in a minute. He can't play king here because the queen would go checkmate, okay? All right then. So what does he do? Well, this is forced. He played pawn there. So I took the pawn with check, right? Okay? Now, if he takes with the pawn, I'll take his rook. So he played king here, right? King to f8. The engine says it's the best move, a star move. But what did I play? What did I play? I sacrificed my queen. Yes, I gave him my queen with check. What a position. What a position. Have you ever seen anything like it? Hey, In under one minute, I've only used 11 seconds, right? 
and then he took it off, and I went checkmate with my bishop, and then he trapped him in the corner with a checkmate. Oh, queen sacrifice. Took me 15 seconds to play that game. What a masterpiece. I hope you enjoyed that game. Thumbs up if you liked the video, and don't forget, come into my uh, Twitch channel. You can see me live, you can play me chess, you can follow my channel.